So what I wanted to talk about today is just tell you about some of the research that uh, we've been doing, looking at neuroscience in the real world. Um, this is work that we do um, in conjunction with uh, Joe Devlin, that's um, him, his, his uh, Twitter handle there, uh, and John Hogan. And we're part of a sort of a consultancy group that's called ACN Labs, but we're just about to change the name, uh, but you can uh, read about us there. And basically what we do is people from industry come and approach us with questions. And just as a sort of career observation thing about academia is as you go on in your career you become more and more expert but in a tiny and tinier area to end up being the world leader in you know one tiny bit of the brain or one type of stimuli and it's been really professionally very rewarding just to sort of step away from our specialties and just throw our tools open to the world and see if we can use these techniques that we've developed to answer questions and people come to us with all sorts of questions like uh, what happens to the brain when you eat a really good pie that was one of them. Uh, can I tell the difference between different types of whiskeys in an fMRI machine? Mostly the answer is no to these. Uh, we are approached by a lady who is a professional cuddler who will give a cuddle to your sales team to make them feel better and wanted scientific evidence that her cuddles work. She probably doesn't do that anymore. Um, but it's been really interesting to interact with these questions. And today I'm gonna to tell you about two of those approaches and how we use the tools of psychology to try and find answers. And just very broadly, when you think about the interaction between psychology, neuroscience, and the business world, um, it ends up being sort of in two different areas, or, or three really. Uh, the first bit of our work is just in education, just talking to people about uh, psychology and neuroscience. So we were in a series of workshops, these are them in real life from a few years ago, obviously, uh, where we talk about the tools of modern neuroscience, what it can really achieve, and more importantly, what it can't because we find that all the people who come to us, not from a scientific background, from business, um, they've been reading these books that can be quite dreadful, that will tell them things like the average person uses 10% of your brain, uh, that you make decisions in one hemisphere, not the other hemisphere, uh, that your lizard brain makes purchasing decisions. There's a lot of really bad neuroscience out there, and a lot of our time is spent saying, no, that's not actually true. This is what we can tell an fMRI. This is what we cannot. So we do these workshops. We now, of course, do them online. There's one in September if, uh, if anyone is interested. So there's an education wing to it. There's also what we call neurosciences marketing. So what this means is we're using the tools of neuroscience, but the end output isn't really evidence or data that we're proving a theory. We're illustrating ideas. So, for example, this is uh, Jo talking to, uh, I've forgotten her name. She's apparently an insanely famous YouTube makeup person. Um, and uh, Emma Ford, there we go. And what he's doing is they're doing a brain imaging study with face perception, looking at faces that have been made up and not seeing the differences. And the idea is not to collect evidence, really. It's to start a conversation about neuroscience, to talk about face perception and how that might interact with these things about makeup that she studies. So this ended up as a, as a, as a video on, on her YouTube feed. She has millions of followers. So here we're just sort of, this is more like public engagement. We're just showing this is the sort of things that we can talk about. Or well, that's a gardening event where they uh, gave a, did a brain scan of the guest speaker. And then the tagline was, come see what's on his mind. And that's actually his mind there. So again, you're not trying to prove anything there, you're just engaging with the public with your tools. That's as marketing. The other way to look at it is for marketing. And here you might have a question about your product or about the experience that people have, and you have a hypothesis about it, and you want data for that. So you, that you can then say to people, we have proved that this is what the product does, that this is what the experience you have is. And we've done some work here with um, that I'll tell you about a little bit later with Audible, for example. Uh, we looked at what happens to your brain when you listen to an audiobook rather than uh, uh, watch a video of something. How is that brain process different? They always pick Joe for the videos. I'm not sure why. Well, I do know why. Um, and there's another example from The Sun where we looked at our work with audience experiences. And that's what I'll tell you about next. So here you are trying to find out something. This is more like a traditional research question. It's frame, framed by the, the, the questions of the client, what they want to find out, but you turn that into a scientific question. And I'm going to tell you about two of those cases uh, today in the time I have. So both these involve understanding collective experience, uh, things that people experience as part of a, um, a marketing experience, they call it, or things that they experience as part of uh, the product, where here the product is going to the live theatre. And we've been trying to use the tools of psychology and neuroscience to study these things. Uh, but of course, the problem is lab equipment doesn't travel very well, right? That's enormously expensive scanner. You can't just bring that into an Ikea store or bring that into a theatre and start using it. 
So instead, what you have to use are behavioral methods and a little bit of new technology, and you can still discover various things. Now, I'm going to tell you about these two bits of research that are clearly not studies that are online because these are done in real audiences and we don't have those right now. Uh, but all of the methods can, and we have indeed ported some of them online. So I'm going to get back to online methods uh, right at the end. So here are my two case studies where we tried to take these weird questions that people had and use the tools that we have in our academic ivory tower, leave the ivory tower and try and discover something. So here's one uh, intuition that people had. Uh, Desperados there is a beer, not a very nice beer. It's beer and tequila, which is exactly as horrible as it sounds. And the people who do Desperados, they do what's called experiential marketing. Um, so they do things like uh, one year, they got that plane that NASA uses to train astronauts. And it goes up into the air, then it drops. And for two minutes, people are weightless inside. And they packed it full of party goers and young people, and they had a DJ there, and they set it up so that when the gravity went, the beat drops, which is a young person term for the baseline starting. So you had this feeling of the music swelled, and at that moment, you lost gravity. And somewhere in ways I never understood, this is attached to the Desperados experience, like drink Desperados, and you have these otherworldly things. And they do one of these crazy things each year. And their intuition that they wanted evidence for was that after having these crazy weird experiences going up in a hot air balloon with Amy Winehouse was another one it sort of changes you a little bit and you become more creative something about that crazy experience changes you and you think outside the box a little bit more because you had this weird experience it's a reasonably valid intuition but can we get evidence for it well that's where they brought us in and we used our behavioral science tools to try and get data for this so this is the experience that they had uh, this year. So to do this, I ended up going to Venice with a hundred of Europe's top social media influencers who are incredibly famous, although I'd never heard of them. Uh, so I spent the weekend with people uh, dressed like this. And we went to uh, the world's deepest swimming pool, which is outside of Venice. And as you can see in this footage here, people had these diving helmets where there's an air bubble inside. So you're like an astronaut walking along the bottom of the world's deepest swimming pool. And there was music being pumped through. There was a big glass tunnel and an incredibly famous, apparently DJ Peggy Goo was playing music. And then you're listening to it with a laser light display. And it was absolutely crazy. And, and I was there collecting data on whether or not this changed your creativity. And um, yeah, this was quite a bizarre experience. And I don't know if you know, there was a scene in the Game of Thrones where there's a big battle scene. And then in the corner, you can see a Starbucks coffee cup that looks completely out of place. Uh, well, if you look in this footage, you can see a, a, an old man with a beard sat in the corner analyzing data on R while all this is going on. And I felt as out of place as that coffee cup. It was an absolute bizarre experience. But what did we do? Well, we just used iPads. Of course, there was um, uh, Wi-Fi connectivity throughout this place because they're all social media influencers. They were tweeting about themselves constantly. And we just loaded Gorilla onto these iPads and we ran simple behavioral experiments. Because with these iPads, I mean, they're amazing devices. They're very portable. It's a beautiful screen. And you can collect proper behavioral data. Like when I was a graduate school, you could do that only in a lab cubicle. Now you can stick it on an iPad and you can go to a swimming pool in Venice and still collect data. So what do we do? We set up really sort of quite old fashioned, not old fashioned, classic tests of creativity. Uh, so there were three of them. This was about a 10 minute experiment. And there are things like the alternate uses tasks. So you say, how many uses for an empty bowl of desperados can you think of? And you have about a minute to generate all these things. You know, you can smash them over the head with it. You can blow over the top of it to make a whistle. Uh, then there's the remote associates task. What word goes with all of these? Uh, and the answer, stop you figuring out, is ice. And then there's a drawing task where you just give people a squiggle and you say, complete that figure. So people drew something like this. And these are standard measures of creativity that have been used for some time. They tap different elements of creativity. We implemented these on an iPad. Then we used all the classic things from your methods class. We used random assignment. Half of those social media influencers uh, did these tests before they went in the pool. Half of them did it after they went in the pool. And we just look for these group differences. And yeah, it was a bizarre experiment that we did about 2 a.m. I analyzed all the data while sat in the corner while a ray was going on around me. Uh, and these are the results. What we found is a significant increase in creativity for that alternate uses task and that drawing task as a result of having this crazy out of experience of floating weightless underwater with laser lights going on around you. We did not find a difference in the remote associates tasks. And that was actually not a surprise. That's what we predicted, because these are two different elements of creativity. Uh, one is you're trying to um, 
sort of classically be creative and think of lots of different solutions. That's what the alternate uses and the drawing tasks tap into. The other type of creativity is convergent where you're trying to work within constraints, solve a problem given that these are the constraints and that's tapped into by the remote associates. And our hypothesis was that that uh, element of creativity, which is grabbing and recombining and thinking of new things would be measured, but not this sort of dealing with constraints aspect. And we found an increase of something like 30%, if you can quantify it, of this type of creativity because of that experience. And this maps onto lots of work in the literature showing that there are more uh, patents that are released by people um, who have traveled around countries. You can relate holidays to the amount of creativity in lots of different ways. So we found evidence for this. The company was very happy. This was part of their com campaign and it was quite an experience. So that's our first case study of taking this sort of intuition people had, turning it into a hypothesis, using all those tools of behavioral science and ending up with an actual answer. The other example that I want to tell you about is a case of a live theater company coming to us and saying, uh, why do people pay enormous amounts of money to go and see live theater? And this was, of course, before the pandemic. And now we're, all, we're acutely aware of what we've been missing uh, for the past year with live concerts and live theater. Uh, but at the time, this was a more uh, pressing, uh, a less obvious question to people. Uh, this company sold uh, tickets to theater and they wanted to know, well, most of us or lots of us have got, you know, 4K televisions at home and a very comfy couch. Why would you pay all this money to sit in a tiny Victorian seat with people who are that far away and you have to put up with other people coughing and eating sweets? Why would you pay all this money to go to live theatre? And we thought, well, that's quite a good question, actually. And we can try and collect data for it using uh, physiological sensors. There have been lots of survey work asking people about their experience, but often that's sort of conflated with, well, I've just paid 100 quid for this. Of course, I'm going to tell you it was a wonderful experience. Can we get direct measure of physiological differences uh, as a result of this live experience? So just to show you, uh, uh, to give you a sense of what physiology can tap into. This is the experiment I mentioned at the start with Audible, where what we have here, this is data from about 100 people who are either uh, listening to an audiobook of Game of Thrones or watching HBO's uh, adaptation of it. And we had about a dozen other ones where we, as much as we could, match the, the audio and the visual implementation of it. There's always tiny differences, but as much as we can, the same length of time, the same things were happening. And we measured physiology. And what we found is, uh, first of all, people said they preferred the video version. If we said which was more engaging, which was more transporting, which was more exciting, it's always uh, the, the video version. But when we measured their physiology, that's the top line in this little squiggle. We found that when we're listening to the Game of Thrones, their heart rate was higher and lower. There was more variance. Uh, their EDA, their electric thermal activity was peaking, which is an indirect measure of arousal. And their body temperature was up as well. In lots of ways, physiologically, they were more engaged by the audiobook as opposed to the video, even though they said the opposite. So what's going on here? Well, we think it's because if you're looking at that video, HBO have done the hard work. They've rented half of Croatia, they've, they've hired all of these extras and they've, they've filmed this incredible thing. But if you're just listening to that audiobook, you're doing that work. You're generating that internal word, you're simulating it mentally, and that activity we can read in the wristwatch. This sounds a bit pretentious, but we are measuring the active imagination and it's reading off on the wrist, which is absolutely fantastic. We thought we were very surprised that this works so well. So those say sensors, I just use that to, uh, to show you that physiology doesn't just measure exercise or heart health, it's tapping into psychological processing too. So we took it to the theater, we measured heart rates. Uh, we found that your heart is in the heart healthy zone uh, for a certain amount of time during, uh, during while you're watching the theater. And we tracked it and we saw that the heart rate went up at certain times and we compared going to a live theater, this was going to see uh, Dream Girls the musical, and we compared it to watching Dream Girls the movie. And what we found is that there are peaks and peaks at the same time. So, but why is there a peak roughly halfway through and roughly three quarters of the way through? Well, that's narrative. That's when the person, uh, Effie, leaves the band. That's where she leaves her husband. That swoop at the end is when they all get back together again. This is narrative driving the heart rates of about 50 people experiencing that story together. That's watching the movie alone. We get a lot less variation when you're just experiencing it by yourself. And we've done this in lots of ways. We measured uh, watching Aladdin in the, in the movie theater. We get the same uh, peaks of physiology. We have a big peak uh, right at that moment, which is when Aladdin has his first kiss. And literally, the audience's heart rate as one increases. 
So we've been measuring uh, lots of different things. We're also not looking just at the heart rate, but at the heart rate synchrony. So we have tools to put a number on the degree to which the heart is beating at the same time as each other. And that synchrony in the physiology, that sort of shared trajectory uh, through, the, through the, the space of possibilities, that really seems to be tapping into something of the specialness of live experience, this thing that we've all been missing. Um, and going on a little too much, I'm not going to talk about some of the background research to this, even though it's really, really fascinating, but just to give you a sense that if we put a number on this heart rate synchrony, um, that is higher when people saw a movie together, saw Aladdin together, rather than just read a book together. And also that correlates with the feeling of social connectedness. We ask people when they left the cinema, how connected you feel to people around you, these strangers you've never met. And that was greater when they just shared this experience of watching a movie together, uh, but it also correlated with the degree to which their heart rates were synchronized. And this is the last bit of data I'll show you because it was collected seconds before lockdown, literally the day before we went to one of the last performances at the ENO and again, measured the heart rate synchrony. We put a number on the degree to which these 20 people, their heart rate was coordinated with each other. And that correlated really surprisingly strongly with how captivated they are, how uh, emotionally engaged they were, even how spiritually they uplifted they felt was all being read out in the heart rate synchrony. I said in the last minute, I'll just return to online things because we were able to uh, leverage some of this technology even online as well. So this is a performance of a, uh, a songwriter who's performing a live YouTube stream to our uh, participants. And our participants are sat at home with their thumbs over the camera and their mobile phone. And we used an app that was measuring their heart rate, just invisible changes uh, beneath the skin. If you turn the flash on, the thumb glows and you can look at changes to get an idea of heart rate. So this is people tracking their heart rates all at home while watching this performance. And what you see on the right there, oh, it stopped moving now, that is a visualization, a live visualization of the degree to which the audience's heart rates were coordinated. So I'm watching this live performance. I'm seeing right here the degree to which everyone sat remotely at home is synchronizing their physiology. And what we found is that this is very pilot data, but we found that there is an increase in enjoyment in that performance if you could see this readout of the audience's synchronized physiology. So maybe it captures a little bit of that magic of being in a live performance, sensing how other people are responding. We try to replicate that a little bit with a graphic and it appeared to impact people's experience. It actually worked with the singer songwriter. It didn't work with the performance poet that we used. Maybe it was too distracting. Maybe there's a different way we experience spoken word and music. These are all hypotheses for the future. I've gone on too long for about one minute, and I apologize for that, uh, but I shall finish there. Thank you so much for your time. There's how you can find out more. Dan, that was absolutely extraordinary. If, like me, you thought that was absolutely extraordinary, can you type extraordinary in the chat? This is how Dan gets his feedback that we are all here together experiencing this thing together, which is exactly what he was talking about just now. Um, Dan, I have a question for you. There'll be other questions, I'm sure, in the chat that people ask, so please do put them in if you'd like Dan to answer them. Dan, which do you enjoy more, your academic research or the research for industry? Like, like how, how do you compare and contrast them? How, like, which is more enjoyable, which is more creative? Like, yeah, no, how, do, how does question. that enrich your life? Um, I sent you the really fun stuff, right? There are some quite boring things or people... We did one experiment, um, I, I won't say what it was, but the, there was a company that um, had a car, you turn your car on and it goes bong. And the company had a budget, I'm not kidding, of three million to make that bong better. And they sent an Oscar winning sound designer to the Amazon rainforests to record background music and then create three, 10 different types of bong uh, that we then put into Gorilla, measured your physiological response and asked you which bong you liked. And and you can very slightly hear like a parrot squawk at the end of the bong. That's the rainforest parrot. And they spent an enormous amount of money. We found people slightly preferred one of the bongs over the other. Okay. Absolutely wow. no scientific interest whatsoever. But we answered their question. They they went away happy. So there is the spectrum. And I showed you the really fun stuff, of course, yeah. where I got to go to Venice and be underwater. Uh, but it is, um, I think the most rewarding thing overall is just, it's a little bit of a challenge and a puzzle. Here's my crazy question. Can I use my skills that I've sort of vaguely accumulated and turn that into something interesting and scientific? And it feels like, uh, so you get more of that experience, which is, I don't know if it, the other scientists agree, 
some of the most fun bit of science is that early stage in a project where you're just spitballing and trying to think, how on earth can we answer that? And yeah. those first lab meetings when you suddenly get, oh, we can test it this way. Uh, that's where, that's the really exciting bit. And we have lots of those experiences through this. Yes, I think a lot of us here get an awful lot of joy out of the experiment design part of the process. And it's one of the bits that isn't, we're never really taught, but those of us who fall in love with it, we fall in love with that idea of going, well, here's a question, how could I possibly answer it? And I think that's what some of the other speakers were talking about earlier today in terms of don't just take your research online, do online research, like allow it to open the opportunities of asking and answering your questions differently. Thank you so much, Dan.